I'm the programme manager for a system change programme based in Bristol called Golden Key. We represent the interests of 19 organisations in Bristol, so we run a partnership. And our aim is to improve the outcomes for people with very complex needs, those that we recognise spin around the system who, where mainstream interve interventions haven't worked in the past and they're still spinning around. Um, we're an eight-year funded big lottery programme, so we, um, we're here for a while. We've got another four years left. We're looking at our impact now and the sustainability of the investment we've made so far. Um, we've got, we're also uh, working with uh, the University of Bristol, so part of, part of what we think needs to happen in the future is that services and different ways of working are evaluated by an external evaluator rather than by ourselves, um, which gives us some more credibility if we're doing things well and gives us some challenge if, if we need to improve. Um, so we're doing that with the University of the West of England at the moment. Uh, we've got some, uh, I'll leave details for our website, there's some reports online if people are interested in some of the challenges that we've had throughout the course of our delivery so far. Um, we, uh, we have a range of services in Bristol. We run around, tw run around 25 programmes at any one time. And we're quite flexible with that. Um, some of the things that we continuously run is a um, service coordinator team who walk the journey with around 150 complex clients at any one time. And we've intentionally kind of headhunted the most complex people in Bristol. And we're talking, you know, examples like people who actually most agencies can't work with because of the level of risk or um, you can't, um, or they, um, they don't engage in services or it's the kind of people we might not actually see in mainstream services because they're so complex. But they end up costing the system a lot of money and they often die young, they have very terrible life chances, terrible experiences of services. So we're trying to understand from the real sharp end of the system what, what we can do to improve. What we've actually found is by working to improve systems for that group, we improve systems for everyone involved. Um, so we, our aim is to create a new experience for this client group and for people generally. We want new choices, we want people to live healthily and well, we want people to have choice. So I mentioned that we're running a range of programmes. We, um, we have a, a big focus on system change, on working systemically, working differently. We see the whole of Bristol and all of the, all of the people in all of the organisations we're working with as part of our wider um, team effectively. So we feel responsible for the skills and the opportunities that are available for those people and our uh, investment in terms of staff training for example focuses more widely. It's about creating a common narrative across the system, it's about having commonality around our training models, our expectations, about raising the standards generally by being accountable to each other across the system. Some of the innovations we're running at the moment, just to give you some examples, are uh, we're looking at a um, Telling your story once approach. So one of the big things, we've got co-production involved in our program, one of the big things are um, the clients involved told us was they're fed up with being asked the same questions over and over again. So we're working on um, a model across housing services called a trusted assessment, which is you ask the questions once, and then if you need to build on the assessment, if you need more information, you can ask those questions, but we trust what's coming from other providers. So you have to build a common narrative, you have to build good partnerships across those systems to make that happen. That's a work in progress. We're not at the end of that work yet. And actually, I think, I don't know if you agree, Gary, that it, it's all gonna be a work in progress. We're investing for six months on this work. We expect that to be something that they need to continue working on for years to come. We're just trying to give it a little nudge. We use nudge theory a lot, so nudging different parts of the system to try and get people working in a particular direction. Another, another example of some of the work we're doing is with, it's some really exciting things with the criminal justice system. We found, we use um, green light, red lights in terms of where we invest our energy um, because we've got, we've got um, some financial investment, we've got some resource to plug into the system, we need to make, make best use of that. Um, so uh, we saw a green light within the criminal justice system we're really excited to be involved in some of the innovation happening across there. Um, and we're working at the moment on a recall project to try and improve the lives of offenders who spin around the criminal justice system and don't seem to be able to break the cycle of prison, community, prison, community. Um, and we're also looking at um, how many people are familiar with PI as a, as a principle? Show of hands? A few? Some? It, it's about... It, it's complex to explain and I don't thoroughly understand it myself, but it's about a learning environment, but also about being psychologically informed. So we're also leading on a piece of work to bed that in across the criminal justice system. We've got a lot of interested parties working really well with us on that. So we've, we've kind of 
our projects veer from sort of small, um, we're running a housing first scheme, for example, so that's, that feels like a contained project to test its viability in Bristol through to more strategic systemic pieces of work. So I guess that's why I'm here today, and that's why Golden Key's involved. Um, and I, I, when I was thinking about, when I was writing this, I was thinking about what would be useful to share here today. We've, we're, what's emerging for us is that there's a range of um, principles and behaviours that we need to support in order to make system change happen in, a, in many arenas. Um, and I've just framed, there's not enough time for me to tell you a lot, but there's four that I think are particularly relevant in this environment. The first one is system preparation. <coughs> when we talk about system change, I don't know how much this is considered. We, um, we invest a lot in system preparation because we think that people need the skills. We're talking about a new way of working. System theory, system ways of working, system leadership is not um, how the familiar routines that we've been working on. We need to find a new set of skills, a new set of habits to work in. And we think we need to invest in the system to be able to do that. So for example, we've trained over 100 people across the system in systems thinking because one of, our, one of our beliefs is that if you think systemically, then you can't work in isolation because you realise the impact of that. And that, that uh, what's interesting is we've had around 70% success rate on that. It works with 70% of people who put through it and 30% hate it, really hate it. So that's, uh, you know, that's some of our learning. about. Uh, it, I think basically there's people in the system who respond really well to the innovation and systemic need and the, the chaos that that causes. And there's some people who are actually really good at just holding the system whilst that happens. So that's a bit of learning for us. But system preparation. So that's also to do with community preparation. If we're introducing new um, members of a community who have a really complex history into an environment, think of a location, for example, if we're trying to open up um, new areas, more affluent areas for our clients, we probably need to do some community preparation to make it work. Otherwise, you're putting people in a situation that's going to be very difficult for someone vulnerable to do. So we kind of consider that in, in many terms. So that's system preparation. We also think co-production is really important. Can you give me a nudge on running over time? We also think co-production is really important. So we've, been, we've involved people with this experience from the beginning of our programme. And what we're talking about is people with current, who are currently involved in services, who have current drug habits, current mental health habits. And we think that's because they've got a really influential voice. It's hard work because it's, it's, it's a lot to expect people with very complex lives to engage in some of the professional responsibilities that we engage with. But we've had consistent 100% attendance at all of our key meetings from people with literature experience for over two years. And that's because of the um, preparation investment. We're mindful of the over-professionalisation of people with lived experience, but we're finding a new way. And actually, the, the group we're working with is the Independent Futures Group, and they're writing what they're calling a co-production library, which is teaching us and our services how we could be doing things differently in co-production. And each chapter focuses on one area, so it's, we've got a chapter on how we do interview posters as well with co-production, or how we do events while we're co-production. Um, because I think there's, there's still a long way to go, there's still a learning process and that'll be an ongoing thing. Um, but my experience of that is that it's hard work to get going, it is, but it's so worth the investment. And personally, on a personal level, I found it um, really helpful to have the client voice leading me and leading my work, basically. Two more points. So one is listening and responding to the system. And this is, this is about how we, how we create new communication models, move away from sort of some of the models that we've been using in the past, like one-day consultation events, which have their role, but maybe don't give us what we need in terms of responding nimbly to a system. So we've got an example in Bristol where um, the homelessness recommissioning process happened not that long ago, and there was feedback from agencies, from providers, to the commissioners, that there were two challenges that they were facing. One was the, um, the competitive environment that's created by commissioning processes. It was destabilizing the relationships, so providers were finding it really hard to work together and be honest, share learning, share innovation, because people became protective of their unique selling points. So it was, it was a really challenging environment. They also said that they were getting spun around and spending so much time on short-term commissioning cycles or shorter term that it was really difficult to manage practically and it meant that it drew people away from innovation, from system change. A lot of system change theory talks about needing some constants and actually if you're changing things that constantly, it, it removes the ability to have that constant rhythm. So the commissioner's response 
uh, in that commissioning process, they, they listened, they heard, and they changed the way, they, the way that they delivered it. They did a five year, plus a five year commissioning cycle, and they took a new approach where every service who was going to be involved in the delivery of future were accountable to each other in some way. And we're testing that at the moment, and it's learning, and it's going to take time to bed in. But that was a nimble response to the, the learning from the system. It felt really positive in Bristol. And even though it's challenging at the moment because we're in the delivery, the initiation phase, everyone I speak to across the system talks about it in a positive way. So I'm going to skip the last one, but if anyone wants, because I'm running out of time. Five? Five minutes? Yeah. Um, the, the final point I want to make is about reporting, and it was mentioned earlier. We, um, a, lot of, a lot of the work that I do is spending time with people across the system, talking to them about their experience. And a little while ago, I was meeting um, a senior manager in an organisation to have a talk about a piece of innovation. So we were responding to a green light, I wanted to hear her ideas. And she couldn't concentrate because that, uh, five minutes before the meeting, she got an email from the commissioner saying, I need this information and I need it by soon. And what she realised, well, the reason she couldn't concentrate is because what she realised is she was going to have to work the weekend to get that, those figures together because it's not something they regularly pull together because it's not on their commissioning framework, it's not on their reporting framework. So what we, after a discussion with her, I realised that it sounded like the commissioner didn't realise in that, or it was maybe a commissioning officer, and they didn't realise in that instance the impact it would have on the service provider. They didn't know that if, if it's not something that you regularly collect, it takes a lot of work to get it, and it, everyone's got to drop hands and pull together and focus on this one thing rather than what you're being commissioned to deliver. Now, reporting, I think, is really important. I've talked to a lot of commissioners, and we need to find a new way to do this. We can't just say stop doing that. We need to find a new way to do it. But that isn't a good way to do it, and it undermines what we're trying to achieve. Um, and I, it was completely unintentional. That was the interesting thing about it. Um, we, we're working with the big lottery. So Dawn mentioned that the big lottery have gone through a lot of change over the last four years. They're our commissioner. They've, they, I'm learning from them what a new way of commissioning can be. Um, and we, we've got some learning that we can draw through and share. For example, instead of, we don't have reporting expectations or reporting framework from them. They've got a nationally evaluated, so we've got to produce some client data, and that goes through. That's very familiar, very easy to do. In terms of the system change stuff, which is actually quite difficult to um, pin down, especially if you're nudging, because actually we want people in the system to feel responsible for the change. We don't want to come in and be the lords and change it. We want people to have the skills to do it themselves. So us taking any credit for any of the things that are happening in the system is counterproductive when you're trying to achieve system change. So our commissioners, instead of expecting us to take credit, and which, which actually leads us into these cycles of confusion where we don't know who's responsible for what outcome, and it's a bit messy. Um, our commissioners sit on our board. They live in Liverpool, but they're here, they're here quite a lot. They sit on our board. We produce quarterly reports for things that we think might be of interest. He's on all of our mailing lists. I talk to him regularly, and he comes down and visits our services and spends time across the team. So he's got to know everyone, and he's got to know our partners. And he does that regularly enough that he feels assured. What we're talking about is assurance for commissioners that they're, they're, um, they are commissioning what, something that will help our clients and that they feel assured about that. And he's got that assurance by a different approach. And it means that, and that has significantly moved over the last four years. So I have that experience to me it means we can do something differently. Which leads me on to the final point, um, just to conclude. This is an observation, so I'm open to challenge on this. I believe that system change happens differently in every, every sphere. We can't assume, we're going to hear some excellent examples of system change in other areas. What that does do is offer us learning and inspiration about some of the nuances and some of the behaviours we need to be embodying. It doesn't tell us exactly how we're going to do it ourselves. And that's why we need to do community preparation, system preparation. We need to have the skills to find our own way through based on some of the learning um, that we can, we can bring from events like this, for example. So it, 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 we can't replicate what happens elsewhere, I think, but we can make change happen. And I just want to, the last point really I want to make to end on is something that um, I remember every day when I'm working and, and finding things challenging because we work across systems. There's a lot to be done, it's difficult to prioritise. Um, so this really helped me to, to deal with that, which is um, start anywhere, go everywhere. Thank you.